Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of the Las Asalias Monthly Spotlight. My name is Diana Olivares, and I'll be your host. Our first episode is dedicated to the queen of bolero music, Edie Gourmet. Before Edie came to sing in Spanish and have a very successful crossover career, thanks to her collaboration with Trio Los Panchos, she had already established herself as an American icon in pop music. Today's guest is David Lawrence. David is Edie's son. He's had a long and varied career as a very successful composer of TV and film in Hollywood. His credits include the High School Musical movies, American Pie, he's worked with Earth, Wind & Fire. The list goes on and on. Uh, You'll see that David and I talk about how it is that Edie and Los Panchos came to collaborate in the first place, what made Edie's voice so special, and David's latest project, his solo debut album, in tribute to Edie and the music she released with Los Panchos. And it's titled Nosotros, and it's absolutely stunning. I highly encourage you to go take a listen to his work. I invite you to like and subscribe and comment if you'd like to see more of this content. Uh, We will be releasing a video once a month. Thanks again for being here. And without further ado, here's my conversation with David Lawrence. Hi, David. I'm so excited to meet with you today. Thank you so much for uh, talking to me about your work and, of course, your wonderful and amazingly talented mom, Edie. So uh, welcome. Uh, We're going to dive right into the 1960s where she recorded her albums with the Trio Los Panchos, who were at this point like major stars in Mexico, um, all over Latin America, really. And your mom as well was a bona fide pop star in America. And so how is it that this magical pairing came to be in the first place? Um, it's, it's, it was really sort of like one of those classic, um, record company recording studio stories. Um, and very simple, it turns out, uh, in 1964, my mom was singing for Columbia Records in the, uh, you know, uh, for Columbia Records. She had a contract with Columbia Records and, um, Goddard Lieberson, who was the head of the company at that time, um, had just signed the Los Panchos um, because he saw the value of uh, introducing uh, Latin American music into the United States. But it was his first sort of like foray into it. Um, And he walked down the, the, you know, where the studios were um, in New York and uh, went to downstairs and my mom was recording an album and he walked down the hall on a, on a break. Uh, my mom was in the control room and Goddard Lieberson said, um, Edie, you speak Spanish, don't you? And my mom said, claro que sí. You know, I mean, my, 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 my grandmother spoke, we were all Sephardic Jews from Northern Spain. So, I mean, like we have, you know, years and years and years of Spanish history on that side. And, sorry. And we have years and years of Spanish history on that side. And, um, he said, great, well then I want to introduce you to uh, a group that I just signed. They're called the Trio Los Panchos and I want to introduce them to you. They're down the hall, they're, they're putting some tracks together. And my mom said, oh, great, love to meet them. And she went down the hall and within, I don't know, 30 seconds, they were going yapping at each other in Spanish and it was like a match made in heaven. And uh, Goddard Lieberson right then and there said, um, let's do a record, let's do it now. Let's get the boleros together and let's let's do it. And the first record, the first single off the first record was Sabor Ami. So it wasn't the plan because they were both had their own records, their own um, projects going on separately. The Los Panchos were signed and I think they were going to do their own record in the States. But Goddard thought, and I thought really quite brilliantly, why don't I take this American, you know, pop star and these uh, Latino pop stars and put them together. Now that she speaks Spanish, my mom was so big, such a big hit at that point. Uh, that would be a great way to introduce American audiences to to boleros, to 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 Latin music, but especially boleros because they're so romantic. And what nobody expected 
was that she not only became a massive sort of Latina icon in the United States, she was embraced by Latin American culture in all of Latin America and South America and Spain because nobody heard these boleros done this way before where they had a female, a beautiful female with a beautiful singing voice front and center behind the Los Panchos. It was always the Los Panchos. Actually, before the Los Panchos, it's a Cubano style of music. Boleros came to Latin America in the early 20s and 30s uh, from Cuba. And then uh, Bolero became its own sort of genre specific thing all over Latin America. Uh, and it was always done with a trio. And my mom was the first one to be sort of front and center with the trio behind. Uh, and nobody's ever sort of, nobody had that time ever seen that before. And they went, oh my God, this is gorgeous. And her voice, because they always heard it with a male voice, not a female voice. And so she just kind of turned the Latin American world at, on, its, on its head because nobody had heard the songs presented this way. So Sabor Ami and the next two albums after that sold gazillions of records around the world because it was just, it was like new music for everybody. Yeah, and did she ever sing this music before or did she, because she <laughs> recorded so many songs, did she learn them as she went along? I, I think it's sort of half and half. Um, you know, I think I knew, she knew Amor. Everybody knows Amor. Amor, Amor, Amor. Everybody knows Amor. Um, she probably knew Sabor Ami, even though it was only written a couple of years prior to the album. Alvio Carrillo wrote the song in, I think, the late 50s. Um, she probably knew La Historia de un Amor. And the other ones, uh, she probably learned as they were culling material. You know, but she also, but she sung in Spanish as a kid, you know, I mean, they were all the sort of Sephardic Spanish songs, but, you know, none of it was new to her. She was a translator, Spanish translator at the UN when she was like 15 years old, so. Wow, amazing. Well, that is just even more impressive to me because I, by far, believe Edie to be the best female interpreter of boleros. I agree. I agree. The way... Um, she is able, you know, she managed her voice in a way that she not only leaned into phrases, but she, there are swells in, in the phrases and the taperings mm -hmm. at the end of words. And it's so delicate and her voice is still so powerful and there's such a, a tone to it. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing. I tried with my tribute album to her to capture that um, in terms of her approach to the lyric. Um, but the lyrics are so, they speak for themselves so beautifully that um, I was so inspired by the lyrics and also by my mother's interpretation that it was very easy for me to sort of create my own sort of hybridized interpretation because I had so much material of hers to, to listen to and absorb. Coupling all of that with the honesty in her voice mm -hmm. just really brings the music to life, I just think. Oh, yeah. Wow. What is it about her voice that, that had that it factor, you know, that touched so many people? It's so funny you said that because my wife and I talk about that all the time. My, my wife and I have been songwriter producers for, I don't know, 30 years. We did all the high school musical records. We did, you know, we've been writing for Earth, Wind and Fire, blah, 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 blah. So we, music has always been uh, a staple conversation in our house for most of, the, of a 24 hour day. And you know, we started listening over the years to her records with a little distance in, in the late 90s, early 2000s with a different sense of appreciation. And it just occurred to both of us that there are certain artists in this world that I think are channeling an energy that speaks through them. It's not enough to have a great voice because there are plenty of people that have great voices and, and they leave you colorless, they, they leave you empty. Uh, there are artists that don't have great tone, but they have such passion that you, you'd swear they were the greatest singers in the world. And I think my mom kind of fused that passion and an incredible instrument. And that's really not easy to do. Um, you know, we, we, we always use the, the, the term tapped uh, where it, it must be coming from another sort of spiritual source because, you know, you kind of hear heaven when she opens her mouth and not everybody sounds like that. You can have the most beautiful voice and go, oh my God, that was a gorgeous recitative. 
you know, beautiful. Uh, thank you for the concert. And you're not left with anything other than, you know, an experience. And when you listen to my mom sing, it's like she's channeling all of this energy and love and passion. Um, I think that's what truly separates great artists from the rest of us. They have access to something we don't. I wholeheartedly agree. And I think that's what makes my mom unique. The technique is like just something that is ongoing, uh, no matter you know what stage you are in, in your ability. It's exercise and it's maintenance, but it's only there so that you're able to produce what you hear in your heart. No question. And you know, it was interesting for me because for years, um, I never wanted to be a front and center singer. I was very happy writing and arranging and producing and being back up. I love being back up, love being 20 feet behind the mic and going all over the place and just having the best time. Although I would sing uh, all of fan my demos um, to you know get to somebody. Um, and I always had a problem singing in English. It just seems so literal to me. Um, and it wasn't until I decided uh, that I wanted to do this tribute album to my mom that I, I truly fell in love with the, it's, it's sort of like lirica romantica. It's, the bolero is very, very hard to describe, but it's poetry. Um, things don't necessarily make sense or have to make sense. It's just a sense of pain and love and virtue and faith. And they kind of all throw it into a lyric in many different styles. And I just, I embraced it almost on a spiritual level that I just found myself wanting to express these lyrics in Spanish. I could never, I, I never got any similar connection I was singing in English. It just, there's so much between the lines with boleros that is, is left unsaid, but is perceived by the listener. You know what I'm saying? It's sort of like, um, when you sing Sabor a Mi, um, it's, it's really simple. Somebody is saying in Spanish, um, no matter where you go, we may not be, have the love we had before, but no matter where you go, you will always have the taste of me in, in your mouth. Well, if you sang that in English, you sound like a moron. Yeah. Um, but when you sing Sabor a Mi in Spanish, um, it's, it's elegant. It's just it's elegant and it just, it's magical. And I think my mom really brought an elegance to that, to that lyric. After such a successful and varied career as a composer and arranger um, for film and TV, what is it that made you decide I will put an album as a solo artist? Um, you know what? That was a spiritual journey for me. My mom passed in 2013 and um, I had, uh, a couple of years prior, uh, produced an album for my dad that were all sort of Sinatra song classics. And we went back into the studio and my dad just killed it. He just made a fabulous album. And I said to my mom, you know, mom, we should do something together. You know, you're getting on and you're thinking about not working anymore and understandable. And, you know, let's, 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 let's think about a project that we can do together in the studio and let's, um, Let's do some, your Spanish stuff. Let's, let's do something that people really haven't heard you do in such a long time. And maybe we can go on a little, excuse me, we can go on a little tour and say goodbye to your fans. And this was like in, you know, late 2000s. And she got really kind of excited about it. And I started calling some material and then she just got cold feet. You know, she was getting on in age and I, I understood. And, you know, Faye and I were in the middle of projects and I jumped on a movie and she jumped on a record and, you know, we just kind of forgot about it. And then, you know, I spent the last five and a half weeks with my mom as she passed. And um, I said to Faye, I want to do something to honor her. Um, but I don't want to sort of regurgitate the Great American Songbook because everybody and their sister and their cousin has done the Great American Songbook to death. And, my, and, and it would never be as good as my mom. My mom killed those songs. I mean, she got Grammys for songs like that. So, you know, a year went by and Faye suggested that I go back and look at her Spanish stuff, which I completely forgot about. And she was 100% right. And I just started listening to the old Los Panchos records. Uh, and I just said, oh my God, this is what I want to do. I want, this is the first time I want to sing front and center to her and tell her, 
what how how amazing she was, what a great mom she was, what she gave me in terms of the gift of music. And I'm so sorry that I can't do this with you, but I, now I want to do this for you. And it just became sort of like this passion project, this spiritual thing. And it just propelled me. I was in our ISO booth. Every time I'm singing, I could have sworn she was on my shoulder going, you know, good job, good job. Or not like this, try it like this. You know, I just felt like we kind of did it together. And um, yeah, I, I think it's probably one of the best things I've ever done in my career musically. That's for sure. I'm really proud of it. Was your dad able to listen in on, on any of the tracks? I didn't let anybody um, listen to it until um, I was done. Of course, Faye produced it with me. So she was very, very careful in terms of letting me sort of realize my vision, uh, but was very, very helpful in terms of performance and takes and style and variation on the album. And I wouldn't let anybody hear it until we were done. And then when I played it for my dad, of course, he just wept. And it was, it was, it was a really nice moment. That's beautiful. Um, she's got such a vast catalog. How difficult was it to choose the final songs that ended up on the album? That's, that's a really good question. Um, and it took me months to, I mean, the album took about three or four years to make. Um, just because of, I had to jump onto other gigs and go back to the album. But it took me months to, to really lock in on the, the 10 songs that I wanted. And I, I basically chose the ones that hit me from a lyrical sense and from a compositional sense. And by that, I, I know that's sort of like an obvious answer, but I, I wanna be a little bit more specific. Um, there were certain songs like Nosotros, which she had a huge hit with. Um, and it's a song about these two people destined to spend eternity together and they have this beautiful child. And because of all of this love, we can never be together again. It's too much love. And you kind of go, who says that in English? That's like the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. But in Spanish, it's poetry. So that lyric, it just jumped out to me. Um, and as far as musically, um, a lot of the boleros are very traditional in terms of their chord progressions. And that is because the melody and lyric are king in those songs. It's not really supposed to be the sophistication of the music. Um, but in my case, I chose songs that had chord progressions that I felt I could um, impose my harmonic sensibility on them as opposed to just one, four, five, one songs, as opposed to one, six, two, five, one songs. I chose songs that musically I felt would lend themselves to a tremendous amount of exposition and a tremendous amount of um, interpretation while still preserving the structure of Bolero. So like when you listen to my album, you listen to all these left turns that I make, you know, and I, I kind of state the song, but then I create another minute or two of, of a variation of that song that becomes a new song in and of itself. And so I wanted to find songs that would allow me to do that musically. And I, I um, you know, every, when I'd go for a run, I'd walk the dog, I'd, I'd you know, go for a, a two hour walk and try to work through these things in my head could I make this work this way? Could I make this work that way? And then after a couple of months, I, I narrowed it down to the 10. It's beautifully done. Um, the album, by the way, is titled Nosotros. It's iTunes and all over the place. Spotify and iTunes, Nosotros, David Lawrence. It's stunning. I can't wait for everyone to go take a listen. Um, so, it, it, you know, with the recordings your mom made, we've got the guitars and requinto and you know there's some light uh percussion in some of the pieces as well i hear some maracas on the trop more tropical uh sounds but um with yours it's it's still got the core bolero sort of attention to detail it's, it's really connected to the sound that was created in those original recordings but i love the layering and the mix and it's fascinating to me just uh, as a fan to see what you were able to create. Can you expand a little bit as to like how you uh, create the song in your mind? Of course. Um, I wanna just um, 
go back to one thing you said uh, a few seconds ago, for which um, I'm 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 so appreciative and uh, flattered that you you were still able um, at all points to hear the bolero without without me sort of reinventing the wheel, and that was that was the outset. My, that was my determination. That was my mission statement. At no point, no matter what I do to these songs, do I ever get away from bolero, ever. Um, and so I gave myself those limitations um, and then found a way to create within this basic structure of guitar, quinto bass, light percussion, um, and once I created those those tracks, because I always would start with just the rhythm bass and a guitar, um, because I had such simplicity in the instrumentation to begin with, it left me, once I kind of drew a chord map of how I wanted to do variations on the song, still all I was dealing with at that time was guitar, bass, and drums. Once I had the chord map and I had this just open palette with just three instruments, um, I was able to infuse everything that was important to me musically in my life. Uh, I'm a huge uh, Brazilian jazz uh, fan. I mean, a lot of my music is inspired by Brazilian jazz, by its tonality, its its harmonic dictation, its 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 melodic um, intervals. Um, it's all, all of that just fascinates me. Also, big jazz guy, but I'm also like a major R&B guy. I mean, I grew up uh, listening to, worshiping, and and unbelievably working with later in my career, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and David Foster, and all these people, and all of that sort of like jazz infused R&B Brazilian stuff has just affected the way I approach songwriting. It's the way I approach string writing. It's the way I approach rhythmic syncopation. So I wanted to bring all of that as a way of saying, thanks, mom, and do these boleros my style with nobody over my back, no a &R guy, no music director, nobody in the studio saying, oh, David, you should try something like this, or this isn't working for me. I, this was, you know, I've spent a lifetime creating music, whether they're film scores, TV scores, records, ballets, whatever. And you get to a point where after you put in the 10,000 hours, um, you become a really great editor and critic of your work. So, you know, I know what works. I know what doesn't. I know what sucks. I know what's great. Well, not a lot is great. But I know when it's great, it's great. Um, and then I just found myself editing and taking away and redoing and editing and taking away and redoing. And each song took several months just of tracks and vocals until it was exactly the way I wanted it. And I gave myself all of that time. I didn't care how long it was going to take to make mistakes just to make it better. Um, and I found myself mostly because, you know, as a composer, you, you have the, the tendency to overwrite that all my best stuff started coming and happening when I started removing elements. And, you know, it was just getting too congested. I had too many ideas. And then once I let two or three simple ideas flow, um, it just kind of, everything just kind of opened up and it just allowed me to be much more economical and artistic at the same time. But it was important that it was my style and embracing bolero while you got a chance to hear what, where my head is musically and you totally understood that I was dealing with bolero and nothing else. I wasn't, I wasn't, destroying any um any genre yeah well it's definitely as you said it's a beautiful tribute because it's not uh you know replication with your voice on top of of it so it's i just i am a fan now for sure thank you and um that's quite a lot of work it's quite the process and it's uh seems to be very much in in your mind at the piano at you know at, at and with the software did you find any of it to be cathartic were there moments when you could just let whatever flow out flow out emotionally no question um these these are amazing questions by the way i mean seriously i'm so impressed with your music sense and appreciation so let me just say that these are are truly incredible questions um yeah you know what's interesting and i, I i've said this to a few colleagues it's sort of like i would never ever get paid 
to do a job like this because it's too emotional. It's almost too musical. It's too um, honoring of a genre. It's too much of what I want to say musically um, that, you know, if it wasn't a tribute album to my mom from a son of a genre, I don't think anybody would have taken this album seriously. Um, you know, most of my work when I when I when I write a big movie score, um, God, there's 60 people with notes and they're just throwing crap at you and take this out and throw this in and this is too much and blah blah. blah. And that's really that's part of the job. That's you know it's a business. Um, I wanted to make this record not a business, and in order to do that, I had to be really really careful about putting all my heart and soul into it without being overindulgent because there are a lot of artists that do passion projects that you just fall asleep to it's just too much it's too varied it's too out there it just makes left turns and right turns but i wanted to, you know man but i wanted to say everything i wanted to say well you, you can't do that um you still have to be incredibly strict with saying what you want to say and allowing the audience to absorb it without hitting him on the head with too much information. So that I think was the hardest job for me for this album is I wanna say so much musically, but I've gotta be really careful. And yet I want people to kind of know where my headspace is. That was the challenge. That's what really took a long time. I will say I discovered your mom. I mean, I'd heard her voice. Her voice was familiar to me. Um, and then I was assigned a song to learn when I was a member of a mariachi and it was Vereda Tropical. Oh, and one of my favorites. One of my absolute favorites. And, you know, I, you know, it's the process to just kind of get it in my voice and learn the notes. And then my favorite part of the, of singing is the interpretation of it, right? And uh, asking all the whys. Why am I going to pull off from this note? Or why is this word up on this note when it could very well work harmonically down here? And so it's, it's making it honest in my voice. And, and it's my favorite process. And a lot of times it's the most selfish part because it feels great to sit at the piano and to make it about me and what feels good to me and uh, what feels good to express. And many times just to let myself cry, right? Just from the beauty of the music. So that when I get to the performance, it's not about me at all. It's about using this vessel to communicate this beautiful music and keep sharing it so that it can connect with the audience. You know, it's so interesting. Um, Vereda Tropical at first glance is not something you would, at least I didn't immediately gravitate to um, because listening to my mom's record, it was, she had like a, like a falsetto thing that she started with the beginning and an octave below with the Los Panchos. And it felt very ethnic and wonderful, but uh, it, 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 the first time I listened to it, um, I was kind of, well, this is, this is an, it's, it's a departure melodically and a departure in terms of chord progression, but I was trying to make sense of it. And by the third or fourth time I heard it, I knew this was going to be one of my favorite songs on the album. And I made it very passionate and sensual. Um, as opposed to the intent originally on my mom's record um, was more of a um, more of a um, more of a dissertation about walk with me on this path so we can be together and you know we will find truth together and it was it was it was it was a little bit more cerebral than I wanted to make it I wanted to make it um, two people under a palm tree. Um, so in love with each other and I don't ever want to leave this space in my life and I just really made it this sensual sort of song um, that I didn't think it was in its first incarnation and then the last half of the song I create this thanks to Maurice White and Earth, Wind and Fire I really mean that um, I created this entirely different sort of chord progression build to the ride out that just is like this whole other piece of the song that never existed before and yet when you hear it it's as if it was always there when it was composed 60 years ago you know and i just it's one of my favorite tracks on the record 
amazing. I'm so happy that you gave it another shot because it's, it's, it's stunning. It's so beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's one of my faves. And um, just from, you know, I can't help myself when I listen to uh, these albums and many singers listening to the uh, tone and the placement of the voice just because I'm a, a voice coach. And uh, on Sabor Ami, it's, it's beautiful. And at the end, you've got this falsetto that you go into that is so supported and, and focused and balanced and it's placed beautifully. Um, did you always have these chops or is it something you had to develop? Uh, yes, I, I, I always had these chops. Um, I, I just, you know, I grew up uh, not with just one famous parent, but two famous parents and two famous parents as singers. So once I decided that I wanted to go into music um, and ask any celebrity child, uh, they will pick the direction that is least the direction of their parents so they don't get compared to you know, them. Um, and so I uh, had much better uh, compositional chops than either of my parents. And um, uh, I was a, a, a more um, sophisticated musician than, than either of my parents. And I really felt like I could carve uh, a career for myself as a, a composer and an arranger and orchestrator and producer. Um, but I loved singing, but I was just way too self-conscious to be, you know, David Lawrence sings his new album. It's, oh, I just, cool. Uh, I couldn't do that at all. Um, but I didn't mind singing demos, but boy, oh boy, did I have a blast singing backup. Um, yeah, so I, I always had those chops and never really wanted to be an artist uh, until this record. And uh, I blame my mom because she didn't give me the chance to do this record with her. I wanted to do this with her. And so I felt this real spiritual need to do this for her. And uh, it propelled me to want to be front and center and give it everything I had. You know, not a shy singer, but a very confident singer uh, who knew and knows that he's got the chops to do whatever he wants to do, but, you know, be focused, be really, really focused. The falsetto at the end of Sabor Ami is actually a real um, nod and homage to my mom because she would do that on so many of her records where she would just go up into the stratosphere because she had those chops and she had those, that range. And you listen to some of these records in the 60s and you just kind of go, oh my God. I mean, she's down here and then she goes, ah! and it's just like nuts. And I clearly inherited that from her because my dad doesn't have a falsetto at all. He has a fabulous rich baritone, but you know, never anything, you know, crazy high. And I've been singing like that since I'm a kid. And I intentionally did that on Sabor Ami as, as an homage to my mom. I was very careful um, not to do that in any of the other tracks uh, where I am singing very high in falsetto in backup stuff. And I'm very, very comfortable with that. But I wanted to showcase Sabor Ami because that was probably her biggest hit. And everybody associates that song with her. That stuff that I do at the end in the falsetto is literally, mom, this is for you. It's literally, mom, this is for you. And um, it was my wife's suggestion. She said, you've got the chops, you know, night and day, and this is a perfect spot to, to put it in. And I wanted to be respectful and not just, you know how sometimes people just kind of sing to sing to show you how high they can sing. That was not, I mean, oh God, no, this, this had to be my mom. It was, I was in her headspace when I was singing this song. So that's, that's why it's there. This album came out like a little before this crazy pandemic yeah. swept across. So have you been able to go out and, and perform in public and be front and center? No, we were just, we were just about to. And that's the, that we, we were just getting all the pieces together and we were gonna kind of start here locally in Southern California and then go to Miami and then go to Mexico. Um, and look at South America in certain places, Puerto Rico. I was gonna think about the Dominican Republic. Um, we were just getting that together. And I mean, literally, as, as we all know, I mean, COVID in terms of the shutdowns virtually kind of happened overnight. So uh, it's on a back burner. And, you know, I'm thinking about maybe doing a follow-up album, which would give me more material if and when I ever do want to tour with it. Um, but uh, 
yeah, that's that's a little regret, but um, it pales in comparison to the pain and suffering other people have experienced through this. So, of course, and I, I'm sure it gives you time to plan, you know, and uh, set things in motion. And um, it, it's a silver lining, definitely. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So, no question. I, I hope you can make your way down to Tucson. No, I, uh, actually, I, I should have mentioned that. I, I should have mentioned that uh, with the touring uh, dates. Uh, that is absolutely one of the places we wanted to go because it is such, you know, there's this explosion of bolero culture happening in Southern California right now. I, you know, yeah, I don't know why, but it's just like musica romantica and it's just exploding. Um, and, you know, it's finding its kind of sweet spot you know, along the southern states and um, not so much in Florida, which is uh, very, very heavy reggaeton and Cubano music, but, um, you know, it's certainly in Texas, it's certainly in New Mexico, it's certainly in Arizona, it's certainly in, in Southern California, uh, certainly in San Diego. Um, there are places that are just, where this music is just reviving itself, you know, where mariachi is becoming, and, you know, uh, and regional is becoming so big again. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping that when all of this is over, that I'll get a chance to, um, to do something about it. I would love, I would love people to hear my, my homage, you know. I mean, I feel like I could just talk to you all day and. Um... Uh, me too. <laughs> I have so much, so much more to ask, but I think I'll just ask just one more thing. If your mom could express anything, what sort of advice do you think she'd have? Um, I think it's really, really simple because she's been saying it her whole, whole career. Um, it's sing like you mean it. Sing like you mean it. Like you really, really mean it. You have to transform yourself. It's... It's like, it's like doing Hamlet. You, you have to be Hamlet to do Hamlet. You can't just say the words. Um, sing like you mean it. And, and, and I would think also, make sure the material that you select, and she said this too, resonates with you. Don't sing it just to sing it. Sing it because it means something to you. And it will, it, it will make it much easier to sing it like you mean it when you resonate with something. Yeah. Um, she's saying that since I'm a kid. And you can hear it, you can hear it. Yeah, that she yeah. lives by it. So uh, yeah. thank you it's simple so advice, much. Simple advice, but it's not easily taken. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, well, thank you. I am just immensely grateful for- I am too, thank you. This chat and um, yeah, Absolutely. until next time, until you come to Tucson and we get to sort of uh, find a person. <laughs> Espero que podemos hablar otra vez. Nos vemos.